A big hello and welcome to our show. I'm Carl Azus. We hope you're in the middle of a good week or that it's about to get that way. Since last year, people around the world have been wondering when are things going to get back to normal. Globally, we're not there yet. The nation of India recently became the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic. Johns Hopkins University says it's still recording hundreds of thousands of new positive tests per day, but there has been a steady decrease in that number over the past week or so. International health officials have reported roughly 164 million COVID cases since the virus started spreading last year. It's been cited as a factor in more than 3 million deaths. Since an estimated 40% of people who catch the disease don't show symptoms and may not get tested, its overall survival rate is estimated at around 99.5%. But the risk is higher for older people and those who had certain health conditions before catching it. As far as treatments go, a lot of focus has been on vaccines. There are several of them being used around the world. They were developed faster than any other vaccines in history. But there's also been extensive research on existing therapeutic drugs. Several of them have been shown to help people recover or avoid hospitalizations related to coronavirus. One of the latest is an asthma drug studied at Oxford University. There are still shortages of different materials impacted by COVID-related shutdowns. Toilet paper is no longer one of them. But computer chips, bicycles, wood, steel, gasoline, these are all in short supply. That's having impacts on the prices of goods and homes. American communities are returning to normalcy at different paces. In some areas, it's been more or less business as usual since last summer, with meetings being held, sports being played, trips being made. In others, where businesses were closed and people were more isolated for longer periods of time, there could be more of an adjustment period when life returns to the way it was. Confined largely to our homes, deprived of freedoms, experiences, and human connections, Somehow, we have mostly learned to get by. Now in countries with advanced vaccine programs, we must adapt again. To crowds, to conversations, to a pace of life that seems distant and personally a little intimidating. And that makes me feel nervous, anxious, even fearful. Hmm. But I don't know why I'm feeling this way. I think we have all become a little uh, inclined to be closed in and hesitant to go back to that normal life. And we need to reinvigorate that social muscle. Psychologist Anna Nikcevic says nervousness about returning to something like our old reality now has a name, re-entry anxiety. But it's not new. This phenomenon has been observed by psychologists before in mm. people who have spent protracted periods of time in isolation. For example, people who have gone uh, in um, the space. Ground control to me. Chris Hadfield understands why some people are feeling anxious. My longest time in space, uh, when I was living on board and commanding the International Space Station, was a little under six months, so half a year, halfway around the sun. Hadfield says he returned to Earth a different person, and many of those emerging from lockdown will also have experienced profound personal change. Perhaps some of the anxiety is fueled by the fear that things could go back, that we could lose some of what we found through this experience. Well, I think that's up to each of us, Phil. How am I going to take this new version of me and introduce it to this new version of the world in as productive way as I possibly can? A, a practical optimism. I think that's what you're advocating there. Is that fair? That's how we fly spaceships, Phil, with a very deeply based practical optimism. Pip Hare believes she is her best self when battling oceans alone. She recently finished a 96-day, non-stop, single-handed race around the world. But even with all her extraordinary courage, returning to life on land can be overwhelming. You just need to remember that we are adaptable and we will go to a different kind of normal again. But you don't want to throw yourself at it too hard, allow the change to happen gradually and make sure you're doing things that work for you. My wife and I were arrested. Jason Rezaian was imprisoned in Iran while working as the Washington Post's bureau chief. Um, I spent um, 49 days in solitary confinement and I went on to spend a total of 544 days in that prison. He knows the complex emotions that follow a sudden return to a once familiar life. 
in my case, I was, you know, one person and, um, and my wife, we were two people that were dealing with this. What we're talking about now is billions of people around the world uh, coming to this at, um, at almost the same time, just recognizing that everybody is going to have a different reaction and many of those reactions are going to be unexpected, unexpected to the world and unexpected to those people themselves. So we should all be a little gentle with each other, perhaps. I think we should always be a little bit gentle with each other, but but certainly in the in the weeks and the, and the months ahead, um, you know, I, I think we should err towards uh, forgiveness. There's going to be a lot of awkward encounters for everybody. Everyone wants the pandemic to end. But in a world where old certainties have been swept aside, we can't all be sure we'll want everything that comes next. 10 second trivia. Which of these US media brands was launched first? HBO, CNN, TNT, or Cartoon Network? These brands are in order from oldest to youngest with HBO's birthday dating back to 1972. One thing all those brands have in common is that they're part of a larger company called Warner Media. And Warner Media is owned by AT&T. It has been since 2018. But AT&T has decided to sell Warner Media to Discovery. Why? AT&T is a large wireless company and satellite TV distributor. It wanted to offer programming and entertainment as well. That's why it bought Warner Media three years ago for $85 billion. But AT&T, the world's largest telecommunications company, wants to change course again. For one thing, the acquisition of Warner Media left it with a lot of debt. And AT&T, along with its investors, want to focus more on 5G and other parts of its core business. So it's selling Warner Media, which includes CNN, to Discovery. The deal is worth $43 billion to AT&T. What might it mean for the other brands and for the industry in general? This is a streaming spinoff that tells us a lot about the future of media. In a streaming world dominated by Netflix, Disney, and Amazon, Warner Media and Discovery believe they need to team up and get bigger together in order to grow all around the world. It was three years ago, in 2018, that AT&T acquired Time Warner, renamed it Warner Media, took control of CNN, HBO, Warner Brothers. What we've seen as a result is the HBO Max streaming service, which has been gaining subscribers but is lagging far behind the lights of Netflix. There's a similar story over at Discovery, run by CEO David Zasloff. They recently launched something called Discovery Plus, a streaming service with the kind of lifestyle programming the company's known for. Food, cooking, uh, house, uh, home renovation shows, all those sorts of programs available in a streaming service. But these services are relatively small compared to the Disney's of the world. So now they are combining forces, trying to be one of the three or four dominant streaming brands in media. First, though, it does have to get reviewed by regulators. That process could take about a year. So nothing changes right away. And as for the channel you're watching right now, CNN, I spoke with Zaslav, and he says he will continue to be committed to CNN's editorial independence, just as AT&T has for the past few years. Brian Stelter, CNN, New York. I'll see you at the pool right after I plug in my Lamborghini. That's what the company hopes its customers will be saying by the end of 2024 when the Italian supercar maker will only sell plug-in hybrids. These kinds of cars have both electric and internal combustion engines, so they'll still sound loud and aggressive. Lamborghini says its customers don't want fully electric supercars. It's making the switch to hybrids to reduce its vehicle's carbon dioxide emissions. But critics say so few people can afford Lamborghinis, which cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, that it really won't make a difference to the environment. Of course, if they want a Lamborghini me one to test drive, you Bugatti believe that rolling around like a Koenig's egghead in a Ferrari really fast car that McClearly bent leaves my Porsche old sedan in the dust? Well, I'd be Pagani in 60 seconds, y'all. Hey, our show drives off into the sunset next Friday, May 28th. We will return in August. Plymouth Regional High School, thank you for watching. From Plymouth, New Hampshire, I'm Carl Azus. Thank you.